Previously, in the story of Frank Costello. Go to school, my son. I go to school, father. I go to school every day. The school of crime is where Frank had chosen to educate himself. I will amount to something, mama. Something better than spending my life in a grocery store. His name was Francesco Castiglia. Later on, though, he got famous under the name of Frank Costello. The four of them formed a gang, an association Luciano fondly recalls. We was the best team that ever got put together. We knew our jobs better than any other guys on the street. And of course, when we got up to our ears in New York politics, it didn't hurt at all that we had an Italian guy with us with an Irish name like Costello. When prohibition begins, Costello, Luciano, Lansky, and Siegel are determined to play a significant role in this new market. That's when we set up a private bank. We called it our buy money bank. It started with five grand and the pot was turned over to Costello to use any way he saw fit. So, thanks to Frank Costello, the gang had an entire network of politicians and cops. What the hell is this? What are you trying to do? Load us up with a bunch of heebies? Take a easy, Don Fedoni. You're nothing but a fucking foreigner yourself. The rivalry between Frank Costello and Vito Genovese was just beginning. Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano were the two most prominent mob bosses in New York in the late 1920s. The problem was, they couldn't stand each other. You're talking like we're on top of a Sicilian mountain, Moranzano. Let's get down to the ground. What do you want? The conflict between Masseria and Maranzano's men reached its climax. The Castellamarise War, officially underway, grew increasingly violent on the streets of New York. Helping out was no problem for Costello, but he disapproved of this war. To him, it was unnecessary, and such a conflict could only harm business. With peace not on the agenda, they had only one option left. Conspire against Joe the Boss to definitively end the war. We knew the old guys and the ideas had to go. We was just marking time. For us, rubbing out a mustache was just like making way for a new building. The new Mafia Guard, which included Frank Costello and his associates, had finally succeeded in eliminating the old Dons. The story was just beginning. That was it. Masseria and Maranzano were no longer in this world. Henceforth, Frank Costello and his friends could organize the underworld as they pleased. They had cleaned house by spectacularly assassinating the two big bosses of the New York Mafia, along with over 40 other old-school gangsters in the 24 hours following Maranzano's murder. The Castella Marise War was a thing of the past. Peace was now restored in New York. With the old mustaches eliminated, Luciano emerged as the primary mob boss of the city. For him, acquiring the supreme title of Capo di Duducapi was entirely conceivable, but he preferred to put it out of his mind for the moment. He believed such a position would only stir up trouble among the families, not to mention that he would immediately become a potential target for anyone aspiring to take his place. Nevertheless, by the early 1930s, his position within the underworld was dominant, much like Costello's, who also changed his status around this time. As part of the Luciano family, one of the five families of New York, he was Lucky's consigliere, his advisor, ranking number three in the mafia hierarchy. Vito Genovese was number two, serving as underboss. With the conflict settled, it was time to get back to business. Making money was all that mattered to the mobsters at that time. In this regard, Frank was an excellent advisor, 
The one who brought in the most for the Luciano family was comfortable making a fortune without violence. And other mobsters recognized this, often seeking his advice and assistance. Thanks to his political acumen, Costello was able to help some of his peers amass money while avoiding prison, the two most important factors in a mobster's life after simple survival, of course. It was during this period that he would earn the title of Prime Minister of the Underworld, a role Frank Costello appreciated and for which he was perfectly suited. By the early 1930s, prohibition was on the verge of ending. The glamorous and prosperous Roaring Twenties were over, and America was now in the midst of an economic downturn due to the 1929 stock market crash. Thanks to prohibition, Costello and his friends had become immensely wealthy. Bootlegging had made them rich beyond their wildest dreams, and without this underground trade, it's certain they wouldn't have reached such criminal heights. But, as they say, all good things come to an end, and Prohibition was no exception. It ended on December 5, 1933. This event prompted the Mafia to diversify by seeking other sources of income. For Costello, the choice was clear. He decided to turn to gambling, particularly slot machines. In the late 1920s, Frank Costello already foresaw the end of Prohibition and the soon-to-be legal renaissance of alcohol consumption. Anticipating the financial losses due to this economic reversal, he began searching for a new racket that could bring in big profits. After careful consideration, Frank chose gambling, a sector that was ripe for exploitation in New York at the time. To develop this business, Costello teamed up with one of his most loyal friends, Philip Dandy Phil Castell. With Phil, he would build a veritable gambling empire, flooding New York with their machines. Around 5,000 would be dispersed throughout the city. Costello and Castell quickly became the new kings of gambling in New York. Thanks to Costello's political connections, the business ran smoothly. All it took was for Frank to grease a few high-ranking palms, and any problems were swiftly resolved. However, some slot machines would occasionally be confiscated as recalled by a police officer from that time. I worked for a captain, a police captain. He was an honest man, and we used to bring in two or three machines a day, and Costello was dying. He came to see us one time and said, How come I can pay everybody, but I can't pay you guys? So we told him to see the captain, and I don't have to tell you, the captain threw him out of the office. Everybody down the line was on the pad. Furthermore, the gambling market would expand even further for Costello. When Arnold Rothstein, one of his mentors who dominated illicit betting operations in New York, was assassinated. With Rothstein's extensive gambling empire up for grabs, Costello stepped in to fill the void, designating his friend Frank Erickson, a notorious bookmaker of the time, to lead Rothstein's abandoned illegal betting business. A few months later, Erickson became the boss of bookmakers in New York. He handled the entire operation, and Costello would simply collect his share of the profits from time to time, further expanding his immense gambling empire. Then, along came someone who decided to stir up trouble. Left the gambler, tin horn, racketeers and gangsters take notice that they have to keep away from New York from now on. On January 1st, 1934, Fiorello LaGuardia was sworn in as the new mayor of New York. As his name suggests, LaGuardia was of Italian descent. However, unlike the Costellos, Lucianos, Genovese's, and others, he entered politics to enforce order. What characterized LaGuardia most was his aversion to gangsters. He despised them more than anything, to the point where, just minutes after taking office, he ordered the arrest of Lucky Luciano, the city's most influential mob boss. By that time, LaGuardia had not only Luciano in his sights, he also had Costello, who at the time reigned as the absolute master of gambling in New York. 
and gambling. Let's just say LaGuardia didn't really have a fondness for it. According to him, gambling was one of the vices that the city needed to get rid of. Let's drive the bums out of town. So, problems began to arise for Costello. He had now become one of the primary targets of the new mayor, who intended to make life difficult for all the bigwigs in the underworld. The police were instructed to harass them by any means possible. A young police lieutenant from that time even recalls being ordered to expel Costello and Erickson from the Waldorf Astoria, the luxurious hotel where the two men resided. First, I asked him nicely. It worked with Erickson because after that first request, he stayed away. Costello, though, was another story. He continued to show up every day. I'd say to him, look, you know my orders. You've got to stop coming here. He'd just look at me and say calmly, I won't be here tomorrow. This went on for quite a while. Every day, he'd say that he wouldn't be there tomorrow. And I'd check, and he'd be there. Finally, I lost my patience and said, Look, you guinea bastard, next time I'm going to punch you in the mouth. I told you to stay out of here. He didn't blink an eye. After all, I was just a kid then, and he was a big shot. He just looked at me the same way and said he wouldn't be there tomorrow. He never did stop coming. Obviously, this charade didn't sit well with LaGuardia, who in response decided to completely dismantle Costello's slot machine business. For once, New York police were ordered to seize all slot machines they found, and LaGuardia personally oversaw their destruction. A real blow for Frank Costello, who had to abandon his flourishing enterprise, at least in New York, because it was likely that his slot machines would resurface in another region in the United States, a region where he could operate without trouble and where the governor himself would welcome him with open arms. The opportunity in Louisiana was indeed about to present itself to Frank. With his slot machine business literally torn to pieces, Costello was nevertheless not to be pitied. The diversification of his activities and his investments in real estate allowed him to live the life of a wealthy rentier. Money was not something he lacked, far from it. And yet, he would still grow richer, thanks to an unexpected business opportunity. Driven out of New York, the remaining slot machines were gathering dust in warehouses in New Jersey. Frank Costello was sitting on a gold mine, but unfortunately, he couldn't take advantage of it. That's when a miracle happened, courtesy of a man named Huey Pierce Long, the governor of Louisiana, who reached out to Costello and his associates, saying, Y'all come on down. At that time, Huey Pierce Long was one of the most eccentric figures in American political life. In Louisiana, his word was law, a state he completely controlled. One day, he decided to offer Costello and his friends to come down south to continue their slot machine business in exchange for 10% of their earnings. It's not entirely clear how the two men met, and in truth, there are several versions. One says that Costello helped the governor of Louisiana in a blackmail operation, allowing Frank to have carte blanche to develop his slot machine business in New Orleans. Another is reported by a Louisiana politician who remembers, They originally came down to Louisiana from New York through Huey Long. One time, Huey went up to New York, and poor Huey was a coward. And he went into the powder room of one of those clubs, I think it was in Long Island somewhere, and somebody punched him in the mouth. And Costello, that is one of Costello's friends, saved him from getting a beating. And he became very, very friendly with Costello. Then, there's also the version that says Huey simply discovered that slot machines were very profitable and turned to the best specialist in the country in that field, namely Frank Costello. Finally, there's Costello's own version, who told authorities that Huey had invited him to install his slot machines, claiming it was a good way to fill the coffers of charitable organizations in the state of Louisiana. Regardless of how the two men met, what matters is that Frank Costello and his loyal associate Phil Castell found refuge in Louisiana to continue their lucrative slot machine business. Thus, Costello and Castell installed nearly a thousand machines in New Orleans as early as the spring of 1935. And it was a wild success from the start. The operation ran smoothly, and the money flowed in. 
Phil Castell ran the operations on site, while Costello made important decisions from New York. One of his friends then recounted this rather astonishing anecdote, during which Frank Costello allegedly committed the one and only act of violence in his life during one of his visits to Louisiana. One of their key people in New Orleans was discovered stealing money, and Castell checked with Frank to ask him what they should do about it. Frank told him to do nothing because he was coming down soon and said he'd handle it himself. When he arrived, a meeting was arranged so we could address the entire organization. They had to hire a hall because a lot of people worked for them, and Frank stood in back of an old wooden podium like they have in schools and assemblies. And this particular fellow had been singled out. I'm a little vague on what excuses was used to have him come up to the podium, but some excuse was used, and Frank had a monkey wrench underneath the podium, he took it out and hit him over the head with it, in front of everyone. Then he explained to his audience that the man was stealing money, and said that this was meant for a lesson for anyone who was thinking of doing the same thing. The way Frank looked at the violence was that it was business rather than physical because it was a way of preventing theft and future harm from all the other guys in the room. So, everything was going well for Costello and Castell in New Orleans. They were the kings of the slot machine, making a profit of two and a half million dollars between 1935 and 1937. A large sum of money they had to share with the local mafia boss, Carlos Marcello without whom it would have been impossible to do business in the region. Gambling in Louisiana would consequently bring millions of dollars to the Luciano family, thanks to Costello and Castell, an adventure that would continue for decades until Castell's death in the 1960s. Now, you might be wondering, how could Frank Costello become so wealthy and act with impunity for all these years? Well, as we have seen previously, when it came to influence peddling, Costello was an expert. Corruption and influence peddling? Let's just say he knew them well. And it's in New York, where his political influence is immense, that he wielded all his power. Appointing his men to the most important political positions? He did it. Electing judges? He did that too. Choosing the next mayor of the city? You might be surprised, but yes, that was also within his capabilities. A former Tammany Hall member, the political machine of the New York Democratic Party in which Frank wielded significant influence recalls. In the 1940s, I was politically involved on a citywide level with the high echelon of Tammany Hall. And the position I held, although it was a minor position, it was a position of influence because I was associated with the Democratic leaders and the Republican leaders. Now in my position in the Board of Elections, I met all type of politicians. And regardless of what anyone says, they were all politicians. That includes the judges, because in those days, you couldn't become a judge without becoming a politician. That was the lineup, and I met them all, and I was naive. But it didn't take long for me to find out the score. I found out that certain district leaders were powerful in certain areas. In other areas, you had non-entities. And a non-entity, regardless of who they were, a law background or a business background, they were non-entities unless they had certain clout. And the clout was the underworld. You ask who is the underworld and how did they get the clout? In the 40s, the underworld were the graduates from the bootlegging days, the roaring 20s. They were the racket people and they had their finger in the pot. I mean, what's the use of kidding? They had the numbers game. They had the bookmaking game. They had all the rackets and all the money. As I went along, I would see different leaders had certain groups, and there were combinations of leaders, and each one had their different groups. Now, who was it who put the whole power play of these combinations together? A fellow named Costello, that's who. When he needed something, he wouldn't go to the leaders. He'd go to the mobsters who controlled the leaders. And they would say, look, we're interested in Joe Blow or Mr. Black, and we need your help on election day. And see it our way, because throughout the year, you're looking for certain donations, contributions to club affairs, to journals, you know, we support your clubhouses, we put your people on the payroll. These are the things I learned as I went along, and it was quite interesting. And Costello was spokesman for the combinations. He was their boss. He was boss of most of the leaders, 
The testimony continues as he speaks of the nomination of William O'Dwyer, LaGuardia's successor as mayor of New York, a character not to be confused with William Vincent Dwyer, Costello's associate during Prohibition. Of course, things were tough when LaGuardia was mayor. But when O'Dwyer got in, Costello had an open door. There's no question about that. So far as the story that got O'Dwyer the nomination, all I know is that O'Dwyer was having difficulty getting the nomination. Certain leaders were against him. He went to Costello because he knew where to get the friendship. He needed the support. He wanted to be the mayor of this town. From then on, Frank Costello held court every morning with politicians and underworld figures, all in plain sight. They would come to see him while he got groomed at the barber in his luxurious residence at the Waldorf Astoria, a habit that Lucky Luciano remembers. They give Costello a face like a baby's ass. How the hell can anybody get a manicure six days a week and all the rest of that junk? In my opinion, Frank was nuts. I wouldn't let a barber get a razor that close to my face. During all this time, Costello operated secretly in New York's political world. No one could truly prove that he pulled the strings of Tammany Hall. Well, until the day Frank Hogan, the new Manhattan district attorney, decided to wiretap Costello's home phone. It was in the middle of 1943. During a call, Costello conversed with Thomas Aurelio, a judge seeking to be a candidate for the New York State Supreme Court. Good morning, Francesco. How are you? And thanks for everything. Congratulations. It all went perfect. When I tell you something is in the bag, you can rest assured. It was perfect. That's fine. That's fine. But right now, I want to assure you of my loyalty for all you have done. It's undying. I know. I'll see you soon. Helping a judge gain access to the New York State Supreme Court? That proved Costello's involvement in New York politics. Which wasn't really good news for the Prime Minister of the Underworld, as you can imagine. In fact, this irrefutable proof that the mob influenced justice was a serious matter to the point that later, Costello was brought in to testify in an investigation that tried to determine the Mafia's influence in politics. Fortunately for him, it stopped there. But the publication of the conversation in newspapers across the country still sparked a wave of outrage, prompting Frank to lay low in the political arena for a while. Caution was now paramount. Oh yeah, there were also things happening on the underworld side. And I think it's time to talk about them. June 1936, Lucky Luciano the boss, associate and friend of Frank Costello is sentenced to a heavy penalty, 30 to 50 years in prison, which he will serve for forced prostitution. 
Behind bars, Luciano is no longer able to fulfill the duties of family boss, a family that, before his incarceration, was the most powerful in New York. A void quickly emerges, forcing Luciano to find someone else to replace him. Vito Genovese, the underboss of the family, having fled to Naples to avoid a murder indictment, logically becomes Luciano's choice. So Frank Costello becomes the conciliary. Thus, in 1937, Costello becomes the most powerful figure in the Mafia, becoming the godfather of the Luciano family. He, who had tried to stay as far away as possible from the underworld by adopting the lifestyle of a respectable businessman, was now at the highest rank of the underworld, which paradoxically did not suit him. With power now in his hands, Costello imposes his philosophy within the Mafia. As the skilled diplomat he is, he diffuses potentially explosive situations, resolves problems without resorting to violence, and establishes a somewhat welcome peace. The case of Willie Moretti is a perfect illustration of this. A story that begins in 1943, when Willie Moretti, a close friend of Costello's, and also his chief lieutenant in New Jersey, begins to behave strangely by revealing secrets that should never have left the family circle. Informed of the situation, other members of the organization soon demand his elimination. In fact, Willie Moretti was suffering from a mental illness at that time, caused by syphilis contracted a few years earlier, and his condition was deteriorating, putting him in a precarious position. But fortunately for him, Frank Costello intervened in time. Indeed, the new family boss takes the lead by ordering Willie to take a vacation on the West Coast. At first, Moretti does not understand Frank's decision, but of course, it was for his own good. By acting in this way, Frank Costello diffuses tensions and saves his childhood friend from death. But unfortunately, it was only a reprieve, as we will see later. When Frank Costello takes the helm of the Luciano family, it has nearly 450 members. Unlike the bosses of the other four families in New York, Frank then stays as far away as possible from the daily activities of the organization, entrusting the management of affairs to his lieutenants, including Anthony Strollo, alias Tony Bender, who controlled the Greenwich Village district, Mike Coppola, who operated in Harlem, Joe Adonis, who reigned over Brooklyn, Willie Moretti in New Jersey. Anthony Litalagi Paisano Carfano, who had control over the entire northern part of the Bronx. And finally, Mike Miranda, who managed the east side. Vito Genovese, for his part, had taken refuge in Italy to escape American justice due to a murder in which he was involved in in New York. Vito stayed there for some time before returning to the streets of New York in the middle of 1946. A return that, of course, was celebrated accordingly. Before Luciano's arrest and his escape to Italy, Vito was above Costello in the Mafia hierarchy. Thus, when he returned to duty, a grand reception was organized in his honor, with all the eminent mobsters of the East Coast to welcome him. Of course, Frank Costello was present, even guiding Vito Genovese to the place of honor at the head of the table. Ah, this Vito Genovese. He was a character, the kind of guy feared by many. It was enough to look at him to send shivers down your spine. Someone who saw him during one of his arrests remembers. I had the opportunity to look into his eyes, and even today, I can remember the experience vividly. They were expressionless, completely void of pity. The eyes of someone who killed whenever something or someone was in his way. Now that Vito is back with his family, Frank behaves toward him with great caution, but paradoxically, also with great respect. In particular, he made sure Vito didn't feel sidelined during his absence and gradually handed over control of the family to him without protest. A mark of respect that didn't seem to completely satisfy Vito, who had seen the power Frank had accumulated during his stay in Italy. He became jealous of his political connections his immense fortune, and his influence within the underworld. Having aspired to ultimate power within the Mafia by becoming the boss of all bosses. In short, for Vito, it was intolerable. Don Vitone's return did not bode well for Costello. 
end of 1946. Lucky Luciano, who had in the meantime been deported to Italy, arrives in Cuba with the aim of organizing a new summit of organized crime. With the help of his faithful friend Meyer Lansky, he prepares a meeting to which the biggest figures of the American underworld are invited, a conference that is to take place in Havana. Arriving first, Luciano is determined to take back control of the organization from which he had been excluded in 1936, the year of his incarceration. However, the fact that Luciano had been sidelined did not mean that he had been completely put aside. No. In fact, he still had a say in just about everything, including decisions within the family. Frank Costello had indeed been propelled to the rank of godfather, but he remained Lucky's representative, who directed operations from a distance and, now that he was less than 150 kilometers from the American shores, he intended to resume his place. The Havana Conference took place in the week of December 22nd, 1946. Among the list of guests were some of the most influential mobsters, including those from New York, where Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, Albert Anastasia, Anthony Carfano, Mike Miranda, Joseph Bonanno, Tommy Lucchese, Joe Profacci, and Joseph Magliocco were present. New Jersey with Willie Moretti and Longies Willman. Chicago with Tony Accardo and the Fischetti brothers, who brought along the famous star Frank Sinatra. New Orleans with Carlos Marcello and Phil Castell. Santo Traficante Jr. for Florida, Mo Dalitz from Cleveland, Joseph Stature from Las Vegas, and finally, Stefano Magadino from Buffalo. After feasting, the mobsters begin to discuss business, when the moment arrives to discuss the case of Bugsy Siegel. Bugsy Siegel had indeed been sent a few years earlier by the Mafia to the West Coast to oversee the construction of a casino in Las Vegas, named Flamingo. Bugsy had then convinced Costello to invest in this venture, which had prompted other mobsters to follow suit. The problem was that the project exceeded the initial budget by several million dollars, not to mention the fact that opening was delayed, which made the mob investors particularly unhappy, eagerly awaiting their return on investment. Acting on his own and not obeying orders, Bugsy had therefore put himself in a delicate situation. Especially since he was also suspected, with his mistress, Virginia Hall, of stealing money from the cash register. The Havana meeting was thus an opportunity for some to demand his elimination. Bugsy was in danger, there was no doubt, but the worst part was that Costello was also at risk since it was he who had encouraged his comrades to inject money into the project, which was enough to put him in an equally precarious situation. Some guests at the meeting personally complained to Lucky about the lost money. It is said that some even wanted Costello's death as punishment. And although Luciano was his old friend, it was difficult for him to contain the irritation of the disgruntled investors. Money was one of the most important things in the Mafia, and it was not to be trifled with. Lucky therefore told Costello to figure out a way to get the money back one way or another. Otherwise, I can't hold them back. What happens to Bugsy? Him, I can't help. Frank will eventually survive the Flamingo fiasco by recovering the lost money. For Bugsy Siegel, however, it was a different story. He will indeed be coldly shot in his Beverly Hills home on June 20th, 1947. Back in New York, Frank discovers how much his name has been tarnished since the phone recording affair, a scandal that had definitely put him in the spotlight. However, even if he strives to appear legitimate in the eyes of the general public, now he is tagged as a gangster. Partly because of his alleged ties to Lucky Luciano and the Mafia, and partly because he was considered the king of slot machines. Not to mention the fact that he had been a major bootlegger during Prohibition. In short, all these things did not help strengthen his image as a respectable businessman. Yet, the worst was yet to come for Frank, who would soon testify in a televised inquiry. The entire America was about to find out who the Prime Minister of the Underworld was. We are in 1950, 
Television is becoming increasingly popular in American households. For the general public, this is the opportunity to hear about organized crime for the first time, thanks to an inquiry commission named Kefauver Commission. Broadcast on television, this commission, named after its chairman, Estes Kefauver, will indeed show how much America was riddled with the underworld. A spectacle witnessed by many Americans. It was one of the first dramas experienced on live television. The Kefauver Commission hearings will take place in 14 cities in the United States, including New York, where Frank Costello, clearly the star witness of the commission, will appear. March 13, 1951, 10.30 a.m. The courtroom at Foley Square in New York is packed with journalists and onlookers. When the moment everyone was waiting for arrives, Frank Costello makes his way to the witness stand. Have you been known under any other names other than Frank Costello? Well, when I was a boy, I believe my mother's maiden name was Severio. Not that I used it, but they called me that. Have you used any other names? Not to my recollection. But you did use the name Severio. Well, I might have used the yes. I might have when I was a boy. Well, you used it after you were a boy, did you not? Yes. Now, what do you mean when you say you might have used the name Severio? Don't you know very well you used the name Severio? I might have used it, yes. Well, you are not using the English language when you say you might have. That means nothing. I'm sorry, I'm not a college man like you, Mr. Holly. You were convicted of a crime under that name, were you not? 35, 36 years ago, yes. The Senator Halley then moved on to something else. This time, he wanted to demonstrate that Costello was indeed one of the bosses of the Mafia. Halley then spoke of the case of Willie Moretti who had also been wiretapped by the authorities. Didn't you send him to California because he couldn't keep his mouth shut? Absolutely not. I might have suggested that he should take a rest and go recoup maybe in Florida, California, or somewhere. What privilege have I got to send him away? Well, you were his boss. Boss of what? Did he ever call you up and say, hello, chief? I called him chief, too. The senators then asked him other questions, including about his involvement in alcohol trafficking during Prohibition and the amount of his fortune. The month of September 1925, did you or did you not engage in the business of selling, purchasing, transporting, or possessing alcoholic beverages within the United States? No. You did not? No. Prior to 1925, did you purchase alcoholic beverages in the United States contrary to law? No. What is your net worth? I refuse to answer. It might tend to incriminate me. The committee directs that you uh, do answer, and uh, are we to understand that uh, his... I his the direction that, is made and a refusal is made, right. but I suppose so. Is that not so, Mr. Yes. All right, next question. The next day, Senator Hawley's questions continued. The New Orleans affair was mentioned, but once again, nothing conclusive. The questions continued. Senator Hawley was tenacious and did not give Costello any respite, who begins to show signs of fatigue. His voice becomes weaker and more serious. The interrogation is postponed until the next day. The next day, Costello's lawyer stood up to address Senator Kefauver, the chairman of the commission. He claims that his client is suffering from inflammation of the throat and laryngitis. But the lawyer's request for adjournment is denied. Now he has reached the end and the limits of physical and mental endurance. He cannot go on. He desires to defend himself and wants the opportunity to do so. The senators ordered the interrogation to continue. All right, uh, I'm in no condition to testify. You heard my statement true, Mr. Wolf, and I stand by it. Under no condition will I testify. So here in. 
until I'm well enough. Uh, you refuse to testify, Father? Absolutely. Mr. Halley, all due respect to the son, which I have an awful lot of respect for. I'm not going to answer another question. You just says I'm not under arrest and I'm going to walk out. The courtroom is shocked. Frank Costello had just left the Kefauver Commission hanging. Just for that, he could be arrested and sentenced to prison. A manager of a restaurant where Costello dined regularly remembers. That time he walked out on the Senate committee, well, that very evening he was in my restaurant. I started to holler at him, call him, you dumb guinea bastard, why did you do that? You had the whole country on your side. You can't walk out on a Senate hearing like that. He just looked at me and said, I had to. I had to find out first what O'Dwyer is going to say. Christ. Everyone knew that he and Mayor O'Dwyer used to see each other all the time. All that the committee knew about was that one meeting, and Frank had to see if O'Dwyer would stand up. Aren't there some things that could be done locally? Uh, that are, yes. Uh, for instance, uh, locally, uh, do you not think that we might have, and the we includes me as a citizen of New York City, that had we known the fact, we might have done something to keep Mr. Costello from having an influence on the executive committee of Tammany Hall. What Tammany does, I'll never predict. On March 19th, Costello reappeared on the witness stand. I wonder if at this point you might explain to the committee what was the basis of your ability to persuade these politicians. Well, I can't readily explain that, Mr. Halley. The idea is that I have been living all my life in the neighborhood in Manhattan Island. I know them, I know them well, and maybe they got a little confidence in me. And if I use a little judgment and say, you should do this because he would make a good leader, an honest leader, I don't know. I can't explain that. Well, it goes further than that, doesn't it, Mr. Costello? Oh, many of us have lived in New York all our lives. I think you've testified that you haven't even ever voted, is that right? That's right. You are not a member of any political organization? No, sir. You never were? No. It is very difficult for me to understand how you would be the man who would be able to sway the election of a Tamani leader, as you did on the occasion of 1942, under these circumstances. Can't you enlighten the committee on the sort of influence, the reason why these people have faith or confidence in you? I don't believe I can, Mr. Halley. Do they fear you? Why should they fear me? Well, do they? Well, you know they don't. Senator Halley then moved on to the case of Judge Aurelio, but Costello denied having played any role in the election of judges or politicians. He then addressed Halley. Since the Aurelio case, I burned my fingers once. I never participated in any candidates. Of course, you knew Judge Savarys? Well, I met him. You don't mean you met him. He's a very good friend of yours, isn't he? Well, yes. I would say he's a friend. You don't want me to pull out those phone taps and go through this the hard way. You have been doing everything the hard way with me, Mr. Halley. The next day, it happened again. This time, Senator Halley questioned Costello about his ties to mob bosses. He was questioned about his meeting with Lucky Luciano in Havana, with whom he had been seen. How did that come about? I was in Miami at the time. I went to Cuba for a couple of days, and I believe I was there just a day or two. I was checking out of the hotel. I was flying back, and in the lobby I met Charlie Luciano. And he rode out to the airport with you, is that right? He did, yes. What did you talk about? Well, I wouldn't exactly know the right words, but we spoke of health, America, Cuba, and whatnot in general. General conversation. Did you talk about business matters? No. Or anything pertaining to gambling? No. Or anything pertaining to the drug traffic? <laughs> 
No, that's ridiculous, Mr. Halley. Imputing guilt by association and seeking guilt by association were the only weapons Senator Halley had to undermine Costello's innocence when it came to his ties to the underworld. To be honest, he knew no more than the police files, which were already very limited when it came to the Mafia. Then came the moment when Senator Toby asked Costello to reveal the reasons that motivated him to seek American citizenship. Why did you want to be an American citizen? Why? Because I love this country. Have you always upheld the Constitution and the laws of your state and nation? I believe I have. Have you ever offered your services to any war effort of this country? No. Bearing in mind all that you have gained and received in wealth, what have you ever done for your country as a good citizen? Well, I don't know what you claim, what, I, what, what you mean by that. Well, you're looking back over the years now to that time when you became a citizen, and we're now standing 20-odd years after that. You must have in your mind some things you've done that you can speak of to your credit as an American citizen. If so, what are they? Paid my tax. <laughs> For Costello, the ordeal was finally over. But the treatment he had undergone during this commission had made him furious, to the point where he would harbor hatred for Senator Kefauver until the end of his days. For him, the senators of the commission were nothing but hypocrites who, by attacking him, were only seeking to climb the ranks of their political careers. Frank Costello would then tell this improbable anecdote that occurred during the hearings. Senator Estes Kefauver had indeed come to see him to ask for a private meeting. How can we curb gambling in the United States? If you want to cut out gambling, there's just two things that you need to do. What's that? Burn the stables and shoot the horses. The most famous gangster in the United States. That's what Frank Costello had become after his appearance before the Kefauver Commission. Now the American justice system had him in its sights. He, who had endeavored to remain discreet throughout his life, had inadvertently become the new star of the country following his television appearances. An exposure that would diminish his political influence within Tammany Hall, although it would remain significant. Let's just say that now, politicians avoided being seen in his company. But the fact that the government was targeting Costello, thinking he was the man to bring down an organized crime, demonstrated one thing. That the American authorities were once again behind the times. Because yes, the true power was not in Costello's hands at that time, but rather in those of his rival, Vito Genovese. By the end of 1951, Don Vitone was indeed the new boss of the Luciano family. Frank Costello, who still held a certain stature within the organization, had meanwhile returned to the rank of advisor. So Vito was the boss, a status that strangely still did not satisfy him. In fact, he had the burning and secret desire to become the supreme leader of the Mafia, the Capo di Tutti Capi, a position that had recently been held by Salvatore Maranzano in the 1930s. An ambitious and risky project, but one that did not scare Vito 
determined as he was to rise to the highest rank of the Cosa Nostra. To achieve this, Vito knew he would have to get rid of certain obstacles. And when we talk about obstacles, we of course mean potential competitors. And that's where the case of Willy Moretti came back into play. Indeed, seeing that Moretti's health was deteriorating, Vito took the opportunity to finish him off once and for all. Unfortunately, Costello's lieutenant no longer had all his wits about him because of the disease, which worried many New York Mafia bosses, fearing that Willie might lose control of his tongue. The perfect situation for Vito Genovese, who did not hesitate to act. For this, he advocated Moretti's elimination to his Mafia colleagues, arguing notably that he represented a threat to everyone and that this elimination was for the good of all. Obviously, Vito knew that he would inherit a good part of Moretti's empire in New Jersey, and that by liquidating him, Costello's power would be diminished, since he would see one of his lieutenants ousted, in addition to a very close friend. Moretti's assassination had been clean and without a hitch. Frank Costello had just lost a dear friend, and unfortunately things were not going to get any better for him, since a year later, troubles with the law took over. Legal issues that followed the Kefauver Commission hearings, as Costello had indeed been found guilty of contempt of the Senate and sentenced to 18 months in prison. Finally, Costello was released in October 1953 thanks to a sentence reduction, but no sooner had he caught his breath than another conviction fell on him, this time for tax fraud. Indeed, after two years of investigation, the IRS decided to indict him and sentenced him to five years in prison the harshest sentence. At that moment, Frank was going through one of the most depressing periods of his existence. Sent to prison at 65 with such a conviction, he thought he might end his days behind bars, and that disgusted him more than anything. Fortunately for him, the appeals court would reconsider his case sometime later, which would significantly reduce his sentence. Frank would miraculously leave prison after only 11 months of detention. So the legal problems seemed finally over. On the other hand, Vito Genovese was devising a plan to assassinate him. May 2nd, 1957. Frank Costello gets up at 5 o'clock in the morning as usual. He goes through his morning ritual and reads the New York Times while sipping coffee. Frank is particularly interested in an article on the front page of the newspaper, which reports on a boxing match from the previous day. Ray Sugar Robertson had faced Gene Fulmer, and the fight ended with a knockout in the fifth round. Sugar Robinson emerged victorious, greatly benefiting Costello, who had bet a large sum on his fighter, winning a tidy sum of $225,000 in consequence. 10.30 a.m., it's time for Frank to go to the Waldorf Astoria to go to the barber shop, a salon that was a bit like his office, a place where, in addition to getting his hair cut, shaved, and manicured, he welcomed politicians from Tammany Hall, as well as his colleagues from the underworld. When Frank moved around, it was always without bodyguards, unlike other big shots in the underworld who were surrounded by a whole army of henchmen. To get to his appointments, he would take a taxi or simply walk. It's past 6 p.m. when Frank enters a chic restaurant on 55th Street East with his wife and a group of friends. They dine, spend a pleasant evening together, and then, around a quarter to 11, Frank decides to leave. In the meantime, two black limousines have parked in front of his residence. Three men are inside, obviously waiting for someone. They don't take their eyes off Costello's residence except to look at their watches. At 10.55 p.m., Frank is dropped off at his home by a taxi. He enters his residence. At that moment, someone seems to be following him closely, but Costello doesn't pay any attention. The man, tall and sturdy, seems hurried and preoccupied. Costello still doesn't notice anything. He heads towards the elevator, when suddenly he turns around and hears. This is for you, Frank. Shot point blank, the bullet explodes in his face. Fortunately, it only grazes his skull, just below his right ear. It's a miracle he wasn't killed. Frank is slightly injured, but his blood still flows abundantly. He is quickly taken to the hospital. But as soon as he arrives there, the police bombard him with questions, 
especially about the identity of the attacker. Frank doesn't say a word, conscientiously respecting the law of Omerta. The police then decide to search his belongings. They find a small piece of paper with particularly interesting numbers written on it. The police then take Costello to the police station for questioning. Come on, Frank. You know it's just a matter of time before we trace it down. I won't answer any questions about it until I see my lawyer. Is the casino in Vegas? I told you I'm not going to talk about it. Do you own the casino, Frank? Since when is it legal to go into my pockets without a search warrant? Hours of interrogation that lead nowhere for the investigators. But who could this attacker be? Frank had his suspicions. Instinctively, he knew that Vito was behind it all, the only man truly capable of ordering his execution. As one of his potential competitors for the ultimate title of boss of all bosses, it was not surprising that Vito wanted to eliminate him. And he was right, since the attacker was none other than Vito's driver and bodyguard, a certain Vincent the Chin Gigante, who would later turn himself in to the police a few weeks later. Not wanting to start a war, Costello continued to remain silent, especially during Vincent Gigante's trial, where Frank obstinately refused to identify his attacker, showing once again his loyalty to the Mafia. Vito's henchman was thus found not guilty. The case was closed. But this failed assassination still put Vito in a delicate situation. He knew he had to calm things down and therefore decided to organize a meeting with Frank in New Jersey, a meeting that Lucky Luciano remembers. After Gigante blew the hit on Costello, Genovese and Costello had a private meet at Longy's Wilman's house in Jersey. Frank sent me word about it later. Vito proposed a compromise because they had each other over a barrel after what happened. Don't do nothing. Don't complain to nobody. And most of all, don't go to Charlie Lucky with this thing. Because if you do, you're gonna start a war. So, they made a deal. What choice did Frank have? He said he would drop the whole thing and Vito agreed to let him retire like he wanted, with all his gambling and real estate. But in the Mafia, many did not believe Vito's version, according to which he would have wanted to eliminate Costello because he had become an informant for the government. For some, like Albert Anastasia, an ally of Frank, who was at the head of the former Mangano family, Don Vitone had committed a serious violation of Mafia laws. Ordering Costello's murder without having previously asked for the commission's approval? That was going too far. Tensions thus rose, to the point that relations between the Genovese and Anastasia families deteriorated severely. Vito Genovese is suddenly alerted by some disturbing news. Frank Costello and Albert Anastasia had apparently met in the greatest secrecy. Vito, fearing for his life, decided to take the initiative by discreetly contacting Carlo Gambino, one of Albert Anastasia's lieutenants. During the meeting, Vito then proposes to him to replace Anastasia as boss in exchange for his elimination, an ambitious gangster knowing that he would sooner or later end up on Vito's hit list. Carlo Gambino accepts the proposition. The rest is history. Another friend of Costello killed because of the ruthless Vito Genovese, a death that would greatly affect Frank. He knew indeed that he would be next on the list. His lawyer remembers. After Anastasia's murder, I was summoned within hours of the shooting. When I arrived at Frank's apartment, I found him and Anastasia's brother Tony clutching each other and sobbing. It was the first time his lawyer had seen him cry. Now that most of his allies were out of the picture, Frank knew he was vulnerable. Joe Adonis and Lucky Luciano had been expelled to Italy, while Willie Moretti and Albert Anastasia were no longer of this world. So he remained there, alone, facing Vito, who now had a clear path to covet the title of supreme boss he so desired. Costello's lawyer then stands at the door of his client's salon, where the latter sees him and declares in a low voice, This means I'm next. For Costello, the best solution was then to drop everything, which he did by asking for peace from Vito Genovese. Anyway, he no longer needed the money, 
The fortune he had amassed allowed him to live in luxury until the end of his days. So it was better to give up the fight so he could retire peacefully. Finally, Costello's peace request was accepted by Vito, who agreed to spare the life of his lifelong rival. However, he humiliated him by stripping him of all his revenues in Las Vegas, Florida, and the Caribbean, as well as demoting him to the rank of soldier in the Mafia and demanding that he publicly commit to no longer engage in any racketeering until the end of his days. Harsh conditions that Frank accepted, he would one day admit to one of his friends that he had been wrong about Vito. His friend reports, There was no change in him at all that I can recall. The only thing that you did notice was that never again did the name of Genovese come up in his conversation. It was as if he had wiped them from his memory. With Costello sidelined, Vito could finally claim the title he desired. To do this, he organized a conference in Appalachian, in upstate New York. The meeting, attended by all the greatest mafia bosses in the country, was supposed to crown him Capo di Tutti Capi. But unfortunately for him, things didn't go as planned. In fact, the Appalachian Conference would turn out to be one of the biggest fiascos in Mafia history. A police raid would sabotage Vito's grand project, a visit that would force the guests to flee into the woods to escape. As a result, more than 100 people were arrested, including some big shots in the underworld. And Vito Genovese's prestige in the eyes of his colleagues took a serious hit. For Vito, troubles didn't stop there. As the year following the Appalachian Conference, he was arrested and caught up in a drug trafficking case. A coup probably concocted, with the government's help by Luciano, Costello, Lansky, and Carlo Gambino, who wanted to put a definitive end to Don Vitone's unrestrained reign. Vito Genovese was then sentenced to 15 years in prison, which he would serve at the Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta. The irony of this story is that Frank would join him there sometime later because of new legal troubles. He indeed had to serve the remainder of his sentence for tax fraud. Frank Costello and Vito Genovese in the same prison, one could only expect an explosive mix. And indeed, tensions began to arise when the prisoners at the penitentiary wanted to go after Vito because they thought he was behind Costello's tax problems. Riots were about to break out, clearly jeopardizing Vito's life since the prison did not have enough guards to protect him. To calm the situation, Frank therefore called his lawyer. Arriving there, the two had a discussion. Frank informed him of the situation. This thing is too dangerous. Everybody's in a panic. I passed the word myself that Vito's all right, and it don't do no good. I want us to have a meeting in the warden's office with the photographer shaking hands. The meeting was finally organized. Vito and Frank meet, and things calm down. Frank's lawyer then remembers what Vito said to him at one point. Between you and me, Frank is something. He is so smart, and I am always wondering what's behind everything he says. And then I find he is talking straight, and I'm the jackass. He even warned me about holding that meeting in Appalachian, and I didn't listen. Thus, thanks to Costello's diplomacy, Vito was able to save his skin. But in doing so, Frank also saved his own, as he ensured protection for himself upon his release from prison. After all, he had done a favor for the man who was still the head of the Genovese family. Released in June 1961, Frank could then retire and live peaceful days as he wished. No longer a threat to the FBI, he seemed finally out of trouble. And with him, the imposing fortune he had amassed over his lifetime, his friends, and his wife. In short, he had nothing to complain about. The world he had known, however, was no longer the same. Many things had changed. His longtime friends were no longer there. It was the end of an era. An extremely prosperous era for the underworld and all its actors, including Frank, who would undoubtedly leave an indelible mark in Mafia history. A gangster like no other, whose name would be remembered for his incredible skill in influence trafficking, a corruption that allowed the underworld to establish itself in New York as never before. His name will obviously be remembered for his art of diplomacy within the underworld, 
a quality that allowed avoiding many mafia conflicts. Finally, we can say of Frank Costello that he was not far from becoming the respectable businessman he had always imagined himself to be. But, well, when you enter the Cosa Nostra, it's to stay there until the end of your days. And Frank Costello knew that well. Moreover, his days were fast approaching. Yeah, it was indeed a heart attack that would take him down on February 18th, 1973. Frank was 82 years old. So, this marks the end of our story about Frank Costello. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something about this colorful historical figure. If you enjoyed this second part, feel free to support my work by liking the video and sharing it. I would appreciate it greatly. Take care of yourselves, and see you soon.